the Karate Kid 2010 copycat androids. And that's okay by me. If you're the sort of viewer who wants to know just how our heroes escaped from the inescapable trap, or if you have to turn to your partner and explain that someone falling out of a plane is not going to be saved by bouncing off the parachute of the person below them, then this film is not for you. On the other hand, if you enjoy things exploding, ridiculous displays of martial arts prowess, and seriously dodgy latex outfits on a totally kick-ass villains, you'll get on with it. You might not even bother to wonder why the evil soldier of fortune come mad scientist at the heart of it all, an albino guy, Natch, just happens to keep a vat of molten metal in his lab into which various people fall or get twisted key points in the action. The film opens with a setup that is all cliché. Lin Dong, Jackie Chan, is screeching through traffic on his way to join Dog and Nancy, Nana Yang, who was in a life or death situation on the operating table. Daddy, I know you'll keep your promise. But Daddy also happens to be an officer of a super secret squirrel organization that might or might not be attached to the uninjust. As he is almost there, his phone rings. Uh oh. A key witness in the witness protection scheme has been compromised. His boss explains, your team is needed, else regional security will be breached. Gee. What's a good guy to do? Well, obviously, rush off to kick ass in the first of the film's many non-stop scenes of gratuitous shooting and kicking and general slaughter. And that's just the first, three minutes. At which point I developed a theory on how the film was going to go, only to be proven quite wrong by the opening credits, and a brief announcement that we were now 12 years later, ah yes. Twelve years later, novelist Rick Rogers, Damien Garvey, has learned something about something related to the original Carnage and produced a novel called Bleeding Steel. Rogers is promptly visited by three spooks, a big like a Christmas carol, with added homicide. These include thief par excellence Leeson, Sholo, demonstrating a most remarkable commitment to his disguise as a transvestite hooker. Then there is woman in black, Tess Hobrick, sporting what every well-dressed female assassin is wearing this season, to wit, a full-length black cape and some serious latex, which appears to serve no useful purpose beyond confining and showing off her ample cleavage. And who is that masked man? Lin Dong, of course, now in a new identity and not aged a job by the intervening decade. The film is not without a sexist trip or two, cute V. The above mentioned display of cleavage, which is not limited to scenes involving woman in black. Some might question why Miss Hobrick's character does not even merit a proper name in the end credits. But then, most of her henchpersons, who one assumes are men, not only lack names but spend the entire film rushing round in rubber anises, perhaps purchased from the same place as the latex type, while remaining 100% anonymous behind all covering dark and perspects face masks. Just what is albino villain Andre, Callan Mulday, after? What is the meaning of the bad dreams that haunt Nancy? And how does she figure in his plans? There's a witch and a hypnotist and even the Sydney Opera House gets a starring role. If you stay with the film then answers start to emerge around the one hour mark. But mostly it doesn't matter. This is a scary fire action romp with a sense of humor and tongue for me and cheek. It's up there with Bulletproof Monk and Wanted, following in the footsteps of a genre of ludicrosity that has entertained us at the cinema since the 60s. Nothing quite adds up, least of all the ability of Jackie Chan's character not only to pass 12 years without aging, but to emerge at the end thick enough to take on a professional as ass and half his agent.